are Florida State's most important offensive players. You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What would happen to Florida State if DJ Uyungle suffered a severe injury? What about Lawrence Tofili? How about Marie Smith? Hi, my name is Brian Smith, and today's show is going to be about the five most important players to Florida State's offense by position. Today's show is all about what you think as well. I want you to like, subscribe, comment, think about this in any way, shape, or form you want, but I'm looking at it for each position, one key guy quarterback, running back, receiver, tight end, and offensive line. We're going to break them down. You can get this podcast wherever you get your podcast for free and on YouTube, part of the awesome Locked On Network. So let's start off with quarterback. And the easy answer, the forest for the trees, is DJ Uyungle. But there's a little caveat to this. You need competition. I've talked about it earlier. I don't think there's any doubt in my mind. Based on a recent podcast I did, you can go back and look over the last couple of days, the DJ is going to be the guy, but that assumes he's healthy. Any roster needs to continuously have quarterbacks pushing the pile, moving upward. Florida State's coaching staff is very high on Brock Glenn. That's a young man that came in as an Elite 11 quarterback. He's from the state of Tennessee. He's pretty talented, but he hasn't played very much yet. Here's the key to it. We don't need to see Brock Glenn take the job from DJ. We do need to see him at least adequately and consistently push DJ along. He can't feel comfortable. People do not do well when they are comfortable. DJ needs to feel the pressure behind him. Obviously, Luke Cromahawk is another guy they're bringing along. He's the third guy in the unit. That's a good young quarterback with a ton of upside. I think he has the most talent of the three quarterbacks on the roster, but true freshman, this is his first spring. But it wouldn't hurt if he pushed along as well. But DJ, undoubtedly, this don't overthink it. He's the most important quarterback. And that means he's the most important player probably on the roster. It's not about who's the best player, but that position is just different. You cannot lose your quarterback. We've talked about this a hundred times because of the Jordan Travis deal last year. And it would be the same for numerous other programs. If you look at the records in the last 10 years of teams that lost a quarterback for more than two games, that was their key player, their main guy. It doesn't go well. So it is DJ at running back. This one's a little bit different than some of the other guys might say, but Florida State's loaded at running back, right? They're loaded. But this is Lawrence Tofili's chance. This should be his chance. And he's kind of earned his way. He's been patient, didn't transfer, et cetera. Lightning in a bottle, catches well. He's good in pass protection now. He's the all-around back. And he also sets up everybody else. Keziah Holmes, Jalen Lucas, Rodell, you name it. They have a lot of running backs. But if Tofili is good and he's an every-down back, He helps everyone else. They can run two back sets. You can put Jalen Lucas in the slot. You can be a nightmare. Tofili is the catalyst at running back. He is the key. I'm really curious on a side note, just from a personal interest, to see what they do when they have him and Jalen in the game at the same time. There's been a lot of scuttlebutt about Jalen playing very well in spring practice, and this is what I'm basing it off of. Tofili's been good as well. But if you get those two guys in space, man, Fake screen one way, uh, hand off this direction, misdirection, jet sweeps. You can do a lot of different things, and Tophelia will be right in the middle of that mix. At wide receiver, this one was probably the hardest for me to figure out, and I went with Hakeem Williams, and it's kind of similar to my point that I brought up about Brock Glenn pushing DJ Uyungle. Hakeem's good enough to start, but he's got to earn it, and I'm not thinking by the end of spring he'll have done that. He's, he still needs more time, but by the end of – summer, and then going into fall camp, it's not a matter of whether or not he is the key starter. This is the biggest caveat and one I'm going out on the limb the most. But if he is pushing Kendron, if he is pushing Darion, if he is pushing the pile in general, Malik Benson and all those guys, because he's earning reps, when the young sophomore that was an elite recruit does that, the other guys are going to take notice. They're all going to play because receiver is different than like quarterback. You don't normally rotate quarterbacks, but receiver you do. And he is a high point, down the field, 
jump ball, take it off your head. Even though I'm covered, we're getting 30 yards on this play wide receiver. God only made so many of those. And he doesn't have the injury history, just being honest, that some of the guys at Florida State that are seniors, 50-year seniors, have right now. He has a chance to maybe break into the starting lineup, but more importantly here, I think he can be the deep threat to help open up the running game. And remember, DJ can run, but he's nowhere near the athlete, not even in the same stratosphere as Jordan Travis. He's not going to make three guys miss and scoot to the outside and go down the sidelines for 60 yards. He's going to plow over somebody, get first downs, make good decisions. But that running game in general, whether it's him running it, whether it's Rodell, whether it's the field, whatever it is, they need deep threats. Having another guy that's a young player like Hakeem Williams would be spectacular for this offense. Offensive line. This one was pretty easy for me. You know, Byers returns at right tackle. You got Darius Washington, et cetera. But it's Maurice Smith. And here is why. When he is in the lineup and healthy, which he was very few times last year healthy, that is a different offensive line for two prime reasons. Number one, he's got the heart and soul. I think we all kind of know that from following it last year. And then second of all, it's just the center spot, man. You do not want to be changing your center. That, that never goes out of style either, kind of like quarterback. Center and quarterback, those are the two spots the head coach hates to see come out of the lineup due to injury, probably more than any other. The center exchange is one thing, but it's all the line checks and everything that the center generally does. Some teams do it with a guard, but it's usually the center when an adjustment needs to be made because there's a shift or a blitz look or they got a unique package, something they haven't seen. He might even be the guy that calls timeout, like, look, we don't know what we're doing here. We haven't seen this front. He is responsible for making some kind of gesture. Hey, we need to call a timeout, tell the quarterback, whatever. Marie Smith is a veteran. He's been there before. Good football player anyway. But him coming back this year is a godsend for the Seminoles on many fronts. He's going to help everybody else around him. He makes the unit better. Never have enough of that because offensive line is about five guys trying to do one thing, and that is never easy. Then there's the last position, and quite honestly, it's just – it's it's simple. It's more like he cannot get hurt. I mean, Florida State needs to go get somebody in the portal, which, oh, again, before I forget, April 16th to the 30th, that's when kids can get in the portal. But at the same time, he's the one who knows the offense. When the next portal window opens, Florida State spring is just about over. So anybody they would bring in, it's not much experience. And they got Landon and guys like this coming in. But freshmen, it's still hard to depend on them as players that you could really do something, I mean, really do something in pass protection and run blocking. It's just not the same going up against a grown man that's 22 to 24 years old. It's redshirted, 50 year, six year senior because of the COVID year. You put a freshman out there. Morlock cannot get hurt. He's going to play so much this year. He's going to he's going to ask to come out of the game. They are thin. It they got they got a couple other guys, got some talent, but they're not where they need to be in terms of balance on the depth chart at tight end. Meaning guys that were highly recruited each and every year. You want it stacked. It, this is not a a really difficult task to figure out. Florida State wants to get back to that point. It positions across the board, and they're not there right now at tight end. Morlock's pretty good though. And if they can just get one guy to kind of get them through this season, in addition to what they have, West or somebody else helping out, maybe they use some other players to move over. I don't know how they'll do it. They'll be okay. But he's the one guy they cannot lose. Coming up next on the other side, going to talk a little bit about the opportunity for Florida State to be an elite program, not only like this year, but like just moving forward. Are they a tier one? Like, are they up there with Georgia? Are they a little bit behind? Where are they as a college football program. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. It's not just another job board. LinkedIn has a network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. In other words, people that you went to school with, people that you've worked with before, you haven't connected with them in a long time, you can find them on LinkedIn and send them a message just like you would another app. You might even find a link to an opportunity that's not even posted. Over a billion people, that is a lot. All right, post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. 
All right. Now, what is tier one? What is tier two? What is tier three? You may have heard these terms. So let me explain them before I go into it. Then I'll kind of go through my criteria and everybody has their own. You're certainly welcome to comment on this. Tier one means you're a flat out national title contender right now. And you're probably a program that's building. So it's a team that's recruiting well, has a head coach and a staff that's rolling. Not like two, three years from now. Now you have a quarterback in place, which is very important. Everything is online to put you in the college playoff hunt and be a top five seed. That's a tier one team. Now, most seasons or even over a couple of years, that's going to vary a little bit because of injuries, coaches leaving. It's very volatile in college football. I get it. So I just looked at it this way. The most consistent way to do this is to start at the top. Do you have a head coach that is proven? who ain't going nowhere, and it's a guy that loves to be at that institution. That's my number one criteria. The other couple are, are they recruiting well, and do they have a staff that kind of does that, those two to go together? Head coach doesn't recruit by himself. And then finally, quarterback play. Who's your guy? Do you have a definitive guy that can win you a game, carry you on his back to be a tier one team? Again, this isn't about a one season deal. It's not like a poll for a season. Look at it this year, the next year. Like, are we set up for a success for a while here? There's only a handful of those. And then there's a few teams below, maybe five, maybe 10 in tier two and tier three. Like they're missing one or two things in tier two, maybe a couple more than that at tier three. They're, they're a year or two away from getting to where they want to be. So let's break it down. These are the schools traditionally since 1980 that have won the national title that have a shot realistically to win it. Florida, Florida State, and Miami in the Sunshine State. Everybody knows that. Clemson, Georgia, Alabama, Auburn, Clemson. They can all do it. Tennessee's done it. Those are kind of some of the, the deep South teams. Texas, Texas A&M have the resources and the money, and they're obviously in Texas. Oklahoma, USC, and Oregon. Washington was an outlier last year. They're kind of a borderline team. Utah, same deal. Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, Notre Dame. Those are really about the only schools that consistently compete for titles. Now, again, I just mentioned there are some, some outliers. Like this year, Ole Miss went all in and they spent a bunch of money on NIL, got some players to transfer from other schools, et cetera. They lost a couple too, but they're kind of a borderline team, but they're not really a tier one team. They're in the mix, tier two, tier three, because they're not consistent. I think they will be one year towards the top this year. They might make a top five seed. It's possible, but that's not consistent. Would you rather have them or LSU over a five-year period, realistically? Would you rather have them or would you rather have Florida State over a five-year period, realistically? You know what I mean? So that's the difference. So here's what I have. And again, head coach is number one on the board. Recruiting, the assistant staff kind of goes together, and then quarterback. You can look at other things, but those are the main resources in all these schools I'm talking about. Spend a ton of money on football, so take it for what it's worth. Tier one, I've only got three teams right now, and that's Georgia, Texas, and Ohio State. Ohio State, I wouldn't have had tier one until about two months ago, and they just went all in financial and NIL. They just – dumping money on on everything they can to try to win now. I don't know if that'll work, but they went out and got a quarterback. They've, they've got a defense coordinator a year or so ago, and they're keeping him. I'm sure he's getting plenty of offers because they had a great defense last year. And they're recruiting well. They're spending money on the top guys, et cetera. Georgia just kind of speaks for itself. They've got a quarterback. Kirby's not going anywhere. That's the, it's the easiest one to put in tier one. Then Texas, they've kind of gotten to that level. They went to Alabama and won last year. They were to play off. They've got a returning starter quarterback. Their quarter or their coach is not going anywhere in Sark. So those are the three. There are a couple of teams that I put right on that cusp. Florida State would be the first. I would have put them tier one, but we don't know the quarterback situation. DJ's a good player. Is he elite? Eh. Can he carry you on his back? I don't think so. You got to prove that to me. So I have them tier two along with a couple other teams. I've got Oregon, Notre Dame, Michigan. Michigan's kind of a wild card. They could be a tier three or four team this year. They lost their entire defensive staff. It's a wild ride, but they just won the national title. It's kind of a weird deal. Hard to pin them. Penn State, can they score a freaking touchdown against a good defense? Bama, well, again, lost their head coach. They would automatically have been tier one if Saban was still there. LSU, they just lost their offensive coordinator to Notre Dame. They lost the Heisman Trophy winner, but they still have a ton of talent. Um, we'll see. Southern Cal just lost an elite player that was the former Heisman Trophy winner, but they went and got an elite defensive coordinator across the way. 
over at UCLA. Ironically, their rival, because Wardle, I know, is USC needed some defense. Tier three, and this is shocking, but when I was going through it, I'm like, there's no way I can even put them tier two because they, they don't get it. And that's Clemson and Dabo. Yeah, he's staying, but, dude, you've got to start using the portal. Okay, you've got to start using the portal. It's pathetic. I'm tired of hearing about it. They're Clemson. They're good. They're, bad. they're not going anywhere near a national title until they openly and willingly use the transfer portal. Let me say that again. They will not sniff a national title until they use it, period. That's all there is to it. They are tier three for me. Miami, that's another team we don't know. They've got a lot of talent, but they won seven games last year. They could be a 10-win team this year. Or they could be an eight-win team. It wouldn't surprise me, but they got to show something. Plus, they got Cam Ward. They have the potential, but they got to prove they can win big games. Washington, obviously the head coach. Kaylin DeBoer just took the Alabama job. It's part of all the conundrum for these schools. You're starting over. When these coaches start moving, It just it's just a big, big wheel running downhill. And then A&M, the most underachieving program since 1980 is Texas A&M. All the oil money in the world, $18 billion in endowment, and they can't sniff a college football championship. They've only had, I believe, one 10 1 season since 2000 or something like that, 99, 2001. I forget what it, maybe two. They just underachieve over and over. It's even Johnny Manziel in 2012 when they went to Bama and won. They still lost two games that year. And the regular season, it's like, it's ridiculous. Then there's also Tennessee. They're kind of on that cusp. They lost their quarterback. They were decent last year, but not where they needed to be. Now they have a, a young quarterback with a cannon. We'll see, but they've got the resources, great fan base. I think they'll be a level two program pretty quick. So is there anybody else outside the realm that's kind of in that that's not normally? Yes, and that's Utah. Historically, that's not a great program, but they have done well. They deserve to be in this mix. I think they are a power or a tier two team that has tier three talent. They're just coached so well and they are so clutch. They're a team that can win 10 games. That's where I think they'll be this next year. Cam Rising's allegedly coming back. If he wasn't, I, I'd put him at three, but with him, he's a six year senior, I believe. They'll be a tier two team. When we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit about recruiting and some of the things that what I just talked about with the tiers and why they're important. And before I do that, please comment on this stuff. If you think there's another criteria I should have used or just how you look at it, that's fine. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, spoiler, 2025, barring something unforeseen, and I talked about this a million times and foreshadowed it, Florida State should be a Tier 1 program. I'm just saying it because of the DJ thing. That's why I got them Tier 2. But if you think there's another way to look at it or something else I should have added, fire away. But we're going to talk about that here in just a moment on Locked on Seminoles. eBay Motors, passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Available only to U.S. customers. Now, why would the last segment have anything to do with recruiting? Well, here's why. It's perception. I've learned this just through osmosis, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm a genius. This is just from hanging around recruits, being at college practices, being high school practices, being at seven-on-seven -seven tournaments, Under Armour camps, et cetera. These kids literally have like lists. Like they talk about the O's. I want an offer from this school, and they call it O's. I, it, for forever, it was – do you have an Alabama offer or Clemson? Those were the two most coveted. Now Georgia's at that point. Yeah, but you don't have the Georgia offer yet. Like it's it's like the new car or the new new pair of shoes, whatever's hot, whatever's cool. And it matters. Those are their own versions of like tier one. 
This stuff matters. If Florida State were to surprise me and other people and be a top five seed this year, if DJ just came out and balled out this year, it would catastrophically change their opportunity for not only, obviously, the 24 season to win a title, but beyond. Because that would be back-to-back seasons, which is hard, that you were in an elite program. Not many teams do that. Usually, you build up, quarterback's not very good, he's okay. He's like his third year starting, he's really good, but then he's gone. It's just the way it works, right? So to have Jordan Travis and then get a fifth-year senior and DJ, they kind of got the home run there because you're playing with experienced quarterbacks back-to-back years that are proven players. Then you would have the experience for those guys moving on, and that's unfortunate, but you would also have Brock Glenn as a third-year player, Luke Cromahawk would be a second-year player. You may or may not bring in a transfer, and you still have Tramel Jones coming in too. You would have a balanced quarterback room. You'd have a lot more experience. It'd be two years in a row because I think they're going to have a good recruiting class. 24 class and 25 is good. Starting at 25, Florida State should roll. Can they get to that point and have a 10-2 and or better season this year in the regular season? They could. If they could find a way to do that, they would be talked about at the top with these recruits about getting the O from them getting the O from this school. And quite honestly, once that happens, Florida State could be pickier, not offer as early. You have to come to us kind of situation, which is what it was for a long time under Bowden. And once they got to the mid-90s, they could be selected because they knew they were going to have a top five class if they just played it played it smart and waited towards the end. They'd get the elite players. And they played their cards better than anybody. That's what Georgia has done. Clemson really picky, too much so. But those are the two schools that are the ones that are talked about the most. Different reasons But Georgia, because it's elite, Clemson just doesn't offer many kids. They're very finicky about it. And then there are a few other schools, too. Notre Dame's kind of rare with them offering early unless you're an elite player, Texas to a certain degree for out-of-state kids. But Florida State's on that cusp, too, if they can do it this year. They've offered a lot of kids here in the last few years early, but I honestly think they have a great year this season. Outside of a handful like the South Georgia or elite kids in Alabama, they would mostly just stick to Florida wait for the other kids from outside the region to visit and make a decision based on face-to-face, and it would change their entire recruiting outlook, make it a heck of a lot easier for Mike Norvell and his staff if they could be elite and be considered a Tier 1 program by recruits. It's something to think about because I I hadn't really put two and two together. I kind of pay attention to it a little bit. When I'm hearing kids talk, I'm standing three feet from them for a long time, but this is something that's important. Those kids that want that Alabama offer often end up at Alabama. Those kids that want the Georgia offer often end up at Georgia. It matters. Tier one is important. Right now they're on the cusp. But if Florida State gets there or any other program, their recruiting is going to go up and so are their wins. Please like and subscribe this podcast and make sure you share it anywhere you can. Please rate and review. And above all else, comment. I'm curious to see what you have to say on YouTube. I'd love to hear it. I'd love to have a discussion about it. Hi, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you very much.